The gospel is an event. In history, totally non-subjective. <laughs> totally objective, outside of you. If you live, die, exist, don't ex exist, and change it at all. It's there in history. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God died. That's essential to the gospel. Any dehistoricizing, any demythologizing that says history doesn't matter, facts don't matter, just count it out. That's not biblical. Christ died. That's the main event. What does scripture mean when it refers to the gospel? That's the central question John Piper answers in this episode of Light and Truth. This message was originally given in Phoenix, Arizona at the Desiring God 2006 Regional Conference. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for Christ and, and his suffering and his triumphant resurrection and his intercession on our behalf at your right hand and for the promise of his coming. Hasten the day. We would love to see it wrapped up. Now help me, I pray, to be faithful to your word, especially to the, the word of the cross in this session. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are now. We finally arrived, and maybe I shouldn't have put it off this long, but here we are, at the central issue of what is traditionally, biblically described as the gospel, gospel statements. It's very controversial to say God is the gospel. That sentence is not in the Bible, and I'm aware of that, and the places where the the word gospel is used, uh, don't talk like that. And so it's a judgment call on my part that that sort of risk needs to be taken in order to rescue the sentences that are in the Bible from terminating on the wrong thing, from meaning the wrong thing. Sometimes you use non-biblical sentences or words to preserve biblical Sentences like the word Trinity, not in the Bible. And it's a, it's a precious word that is intended to safeguard Bible teachings. So here we are now at what the Bible does say about the term gospel. Let me outline uh, five ways or just mention them first. Five ways to describe the gospel. You can describe the gospel in the Bible in terms of events or a central event. Death of Christ. Resurrection of Christ. Secondly, you can describe the gospel in terms of the achievement of the event. What happened when the event happened in the heavenly places? Between Christ and God. I mean objective achievement before anything happens in your heart. You weren't even there. Third, the gospel can be spoken of in terms of the offer of the achievement to you and how it's offered. Is it offered to works or faith? Fourth, you can describe the gospel in terms of its application to your heart. That is, the achievement 2,000 years ago becomes yours. And you experience something between you and God because of what Christ did before you were ever born. That would be the application of the gospel event and achievement. And finally, you get to where this whole conference is about. All of that, I'm arguing, is intended to get you to God. And if you don't get to God, none of that is good news. So now I want to unpack those, especially the one called achievement, because that's the most central. 
foundational, crucial, although they all are. So that's saying that is dangerous. So first event, the gospel as event. It would be good, perhaps, to go to first Corinthians 15. When I was in college, I had a Bible professor named Philip Hook. And I can remember the day he asked the question to the class and waited a long time for an answer. What's the gospel? And after a long silence, he said, I'll take you to the clearest definition of the gospel in the Bible. And this is where he took us. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you're saved, if you hold it fast. The gospel I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And now he starts the definition. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. So the first thing I'm going to say is the gospel is an event in history, totally non-subjective, <laughs> totally objective outside of you. If you live, die, exist, don't ex exist and change it at all. It's there in history. Two thousand years ago, the son of God died That's essential to the gospel. Any dehistoricizing, any demythologizing that says history doesn't matter, facts don't matter, just count it out. That's not biblical. Christ died. That's the main event. The resurrection, I suppose I should keep reading for another verse or two. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. This death is part of a flow of history. Promise and fulfillment. Verse 4. That he was buried. Another fact. Really dead. Really dead. After the cross. That he was raised on the third day. In accordance with that history and those scriptures. And then the proofs begin to follow. So there's the central event in history. Jesus Christ, Son of God has died, buried, and has been raised from the dead. Number two, what was achieved when that happened? Now, the reason we're spending time here is because I don't want you to go away thinking that in order to preach the gospel, all you have to do is say, God is the gospel. You would not have preached the gospel if you said only God is the gospel. That little phrase is intended to make sure that what I'm talking about for the next 20 minutes, probably gets to its appointed end. That's all But you got to go there and get people toward the end this way and no other way. So what was achieved by the dying of Jesus Christ? Now, there are a lot of ways that the Bible says it. Probably one of the books over in the bookstore is called 50 Reasons Why Jesus Came to Die. 50. 50. I wrote that to go along with the movie, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie, what, a year or two ago. And the reason I wrote it is because I'd seen clips of it. And I said, this is going to be powerful and it's going to make one thing crystal clear. He died. But it was not clear why in that movie. There were hints, but not clear. And I just want to make it clear. There's a reason. And there are 50 of them. And I'm only going to talk about four. Okay? So I know that people like me are being criticized and dumped on in evangelicalism because they, they say we're fixated on the substitutionary atonement and we don't talk as though... Anything else happened when he died? Well, 49 other things happened when he died. And I just don't have time to talk about them. And they matter. So I don't feel implicated by that criticism. However, I'm going to return to criticism and say, those who are debunking 
sometimes just in terms of it's overemphasized, but in fact, now neglected, are in a worse position than those who emphasize that and neglect some of the other less central achievements. This one is all important. So four of them. Number one, when he died, the wrath of God was absorbed by him. Or put it more biblically, to quote Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Whose curse? God's curse. When God's law was broken in the beginning, a curse fell upon humanity. That curse takes people to hell justly. If it is not lifted from us, we perish. If the wrath of God is not removed from us, we're under it. What did Jesus say? John chapter 3, verse 36. Whoever believes in me has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son of God, the wrath of God remains on him. So, Jesus taught the wrath of God is on every human being. I have come into the world to solve that problem. And I solve it by taking the curse on me when I die. My death is God's curse on me. And I absorb it. Now, it's not yours yet. That redemption is not yours yet. That's coming in point four. I'm just talking about the glory of what is objectively achieved at the death of Jesus. And what happened is God poured his curse and wrath on his son. And it was absorbed by him. Number two. He paid the debt for our sins. First Peter 2.24. He himself bore our sins in his own body. Isn't it good to have clear sentences in the Bible? Oh, this is so good. He himself bore our sins in his body. Let's go back 700 years. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole and by his stripes we are healed then i picture myself as a little 10 year old boy royal ambassador southern baptist memory verse white oak baptist church wednesday night standing at the grand piano reciting it to my grandmother all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. I'm so glad I had a mama and a daddy who made me memorize the Bible as a little boy. What could be more precious than to go to bed Night after night, as a sinful little kid, knows he's bad. He's bad. And to hear the words, he laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
So clear. So clear. That's number two. That happened before you were born. Number three. He provided in his dying the consummation of a life of perfect righteousness. You might want to go to uh, Romans 5. There are about a half a dozen texts where we can make this point pretty clearly. I'll just pick this one. Romans 5, 19. As by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many, that's us, were made sinners. I became a sinner in Adam. So, in an analogous way, by the one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made, counted, constituted, righteous. Now, you're not righteous. You're not righteous. Even after you are saved, all of your obedience is contaminated. You cannot present your contaminated pre-Christian moral efforts or post-Christian contaminated Holy Spirit wrought efforts to God as sufficient for why he should accept you. He's not impressed with contaminated obedience. He is holy. You shall be holy for I am holy. Be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. To get into my heaven, to be acquitted in my court, you must be not guilty. And the accusation in my court, Romans 3.10, is... There is none righteous. No, not one. The problem with John Piper in the courtroom of heaven is not righteous. Therefore, guilty. Therefore, perishing. Period. Judges don't forgive. Good judges do two things. They acquit the innocent. And they condemn the guilty. That's all they do. We have a just judge. And the requirement in the courtroom is not guilty. That's who I justify. I'm a just judge. I declare not guilty the not guilty. I declare condemned the guilty. You are all guilty. None is righteous. No, not one. That's a hopeless situation. Unless another righteousness could count as mine. That's my only hope in the courtroom. Could another, could another not guilty Could another perfection wrought out by another person somehow in some mysterious way be reckoned to be mine? That's coming in point number four. All I'm arguing now is that righteousness that if there's some way I could have it as counted as mine has been wrought and finished perfectly by Jesus. That righteousness has been performed and it came to its climax. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And when he said it is finished, oh, how much was finished. One of the things that was finished was the law 
is fulfilled. I have perfectly obeyed everything my Father has required of me. And now there it is. What a treasure. If there were some way in this courtroom, it might become mine. But we're not there yet. That was number three. Objectively achieved, wrath absorbed, sin carried, righteousness performed. Number four, eternal life obtained, purchased. You know, if your Bible's still open at Romans 5, I want to show you something. I I wasn't going to do this because it's a little complicated. But it's so significant for those of you who are pushing the edges on justification. That is, you really want to understand how it works. This text is important. So I read verse 19 in Romans 5. That there's there's an obedience of a one out there that might constitute me righteous somehow. Now verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace might also reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. Now now we have number, number four in a text, eternal life. And what I want you to see is how it was achieved. Verse 21 again, as sin reigned in death, so Adam's sin caused a reign of death until death is conquered. As sin reigned in death, grace reigns through righteousness. Now, the question is, what does that mean? Is this righteousness in verse 21 The fruit of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer or the righteousness of Christ on the cross wrought out objectively for me and imputed to me by grace alone. That's a big difference, a very big difference. And the answer is, it is the righteousness imputed to me. And here's how you can know that. The logic of the next chapter makes no sense if the righteousness in verse 21 is the real, lived out, spirit-wrought righteousness of the believer. Because the logic goes like this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? That question would never have arisen had he just said, Grace is reigning in your life to produce more righteousness. You would never think of saying, well, then shall we sin that grace may abound? Huh? I've just said grace is reigning in your life to produce righteousness. That's not what it means. What it means is Christ has obeyed perfectly. God has a righteousness in his son that by grace can be counted as yours, yielding eternal life. And they hear the truth. You mean it's not my righteousness? It's his righteousness. And by grace alone, it's counted as my righteousness. Then let us sin. That follows. That follows. It's a, it's a stupid question, but it's a plausible question. The other one is not plausible. This is plausible. If it's his righteousness, not mine, and he's willing to let me have it, even though I'm a sinner, then magnify that grace. Sin on. Now, all of chapter 6 is Paul's way of solving that problem. He does not solve it by saying, The righteousness of verse 21 is my lived out righteousness. The righteousness of verse 21 is the righteousness imputed to me by faith alone and thus gives rise to the question, 
but sin, that grace may abound, because I get the righteousness from another. Those are the four things achieved by Jesus and available to you. Wrath absorbed. Sins born. Righteousness achieved. And eternal life obtained. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our eight-part series, The Great Goal of the Gospel, with a message titled, What the Gospel Achieves for Us. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.